existing precedent. And I want to Welcome back to the five. We're just going to dip out quickly for a little analysis and we'll get right back to the hearing momentarily. We have been watching this, Brian Kilmeade, for what is this now? Six going on seven hours. I think everybody would agree that this has been a flawless performance by Amy Coney Barrett. The Democrat senators have not gone after her religion. Uh, many people expected that. They've been respectful, but have not been able to pin her down on any major issues and give any Republican senator uh, a, a chance to second think a confirmation vote. Well, intellect is through the roof, Jesse. I 100% agree. I think the decorum in which both sides have shown, obviously the Republicans are not going to be hostile towards her. I found it educational. Dana said before the show, I was kind of embarrassed to say how much I learned during the hearing, <laughs> but I learned a ton during this hearing because it was an honest exchange of ideas. This is the two themes, recusal. We need you to recuse. In case this thing goes to the court and we can't figure out a winner between Biden and Trump, we need you out of there. And we also need you to recuse when it comes to, uh, to Obamacare. And I have some illustrations of families we'll never meet and people we'll never know, which sound like wonderful people. Uh, but I just don't know. I think it's, it's all this stuff. Yesterday was a bridge too far, as was today's. We're talking about law and order, the courts, and whether you belong or not. And I just thought one thing that stood out, too, is Senator Cornyn. When Senator Cornyn asked, could you show me your notes? And she held up, and basically it was just a U.S. Senate blank sheet of paper. To be that confident to sit there and take questions from 20 senators for 30 minutes and not need notes, pretty impressive. Yes, yeah, Sotomayor and uh, Kagan uh, had notes during their confirmation hearing. She does not have any notes. Uh, I think everyone is very impressed by her intellect, her able ability to articulate her 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 ideas about uh, the Constitution and, and defend her positions in a way that doesn't commit herself in a way that would make people think this is how she's going to rule. Well, I think we should point out that Kavanaugh and Gorsuch also had notes, um, she, and she, she doesn't. I, I, I'm in awe. I think she is unflappable, poised. She is going to be a role model for women everywhere, young girls everywhere. She is calmly answering all of their questions. She doesn't get riled up. She obviously knows her brief very, very well. It's almost painful sometimes to watch the questions from the senators because it's embarrassing how much more she knows than, than they do. Um, and I, I thought there's so many interesting exchanges, Jesse, but if we could pull up soundbite number five. You know, this was a moment where she talked about um, how her family reacted when George Floyd was killed. And I thought maybe we could just play that in case people missed it earlier today. Let's play it. Given that I have two black children, that was very, very personal for my family. I had to try to explain some of this to them. I mean, my children to this point in their lives have had the benefit of growing up in a cocoon where they have not yet experienced hatred or violence. Um, and for Vivian, you know, to understand that there would be a risk to her brother or the son she might have one day of that kind of brutality has been an ongoing conversation. It's a difficult one for us, like it is for Americans all over the country. You know, there, there's, we should watch that again and again and to understand where she's coming from. But, you know, the Democrats had tried to paint her as somebody who would create this parade of horribles of all the things she was going to do to people who are not like her or people that are um, underprivileged. And, and I think that today what you saw is this is somebody that you would want as your neighbor and as your friend and as your judge. And she went out of her way also to say, when they try to keep pinning her, saying um, that she was critical of John Roberts, she made it very clear, she said, I don't criticize anybody. I don't attack anybody individually, but I talk about their ideas. I can criticize ideas. And I thought it was just a breath of fresh air. And I also, I learned a ton. As yeah. you said, Brian, I really did. I've loved watching it. Yeah, I think when she does meet Justice Roberts, it could be a little awkward. <laughs> <laughs> the way the Democrats tried to pit those two people against each other. Um, Juan Williams, very, very intense uh, questioning over Obamacare. And I think several precedents, which she was, um, I guess, trying to explain that she would not um, infuse her own views on Obamacare and she would follow precedent and she would interpret the statute as written by the House and the Senate. How did you think she did answering those questions? Well, I think it's a lot like her notes. It's a blank slate. She won't say. 
she won't say what her opinions are. So, I mean, you don't need notes if you just say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. But isn't that what the other liberal justices did during their hearings? No, not all of them, but some, I mean, generally, I think what we've seen as things have become more polarized in our country is that as justices come before the court, I think this is especially the case after Bork in the late 80s, that, you know, honest discussion of your policy positions and even things that you've written before it's very difficult to get out because people think, oh, this could be used against me to disqualify me from the court. But in the case of Amy Coney Barrett, I mean, like on abortion, I mean, does anybody have any doubt? She is opposed to abortion rights in this country. She signed an ad calling for Roe to be overturned. She gave speeches. She's written letters. And in some cases, she didn't even disclose it, uh, not only for this nomination, but for previous nominations. It's been discovered now. And on the election, Jesse... You know, President Trump has said explicitly he wants her on the court to rule in his favor in case any issues in this election come before the Supreme Court. So, to my mind, wow. I mean, if Obama did something like that, whoa. I mean, I can see conservatives just screaming for holy murder. Well, I don't think Sotomayor or Kagan recused themselves for any issue that came No, I'm talking them about this that election. Related to Barack we are, Obama. We are 20 days away from an election. Be... He's putting someone on the court and saying, I'm putting them there so they rule in my okay, favor. Okay, but she answered, and I don't know, Jesse, if you wanted to play yeah, no. light number three. I think we have on. that when yeah. she said that the president never discussed this with her. Let's roll that. I have had no conversation with the president or any of his staff on how I might rule in that case. It would be a gross violation of judicial independence for me to make any such commitment or for me to be asked about that case and how I would rule. Um, I also think it would be a complete violation of the independence of the judiciary for anyone to put a justice on the court as a means of obtaining a particular result. I have made no pre-commitments to anyone about how I would decide a case. So that's what, that's the reason well, that Trump said he wants her on the court. This is gonna damage the court's credibility in your for opinion, generations. In your opinion. No, 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 I'm saying. In your why opinion, would, and that's not Jesse, the deal that they had. Jesse, if They this, didn't have a deal. They that's don't the need... president <laughs> tweeting that has nothing to do with oh, her. I see, I see. Or how she's gonna I act. See. Jesse, would you say David. this if this was Obama? No, you would say, the court is now so politicized that we as Americans can't trust our court. No, I trust the Supreme oh. Court to make decisions have tweeted based it. on the law. Dagan? I just said that, the, you know, the president yeah. shouldn't have tweeted that because it did put her in, a, in this position. I think so. And I think she handled, handled well. that perfectly. Right. And that well, was a home run. And here's what Amy Coney Barrett said. My personal views, my religious views are distinct from my duties as a judge on the abortion questions and others. She adhered to the Ginsburg standard. She is honoring Ruth Bader Ginsburg. No hints, no forecasts, no previews. How many times do you want me to say that over and over again? I wanted to call out, we're talking about her demeanor. I wanted to talk about Sheldon Whitehouse mm. and that hypocritical monologue or lecture that he hacked up in front of her, not asking her one question, not one. He, he implied that Amy Coney Barrett is not there because of her accomplishments, because of her intellect, because of how she's lived her life. But she's there because she's a pawn of dark money. Hypocrite. And you know what that also is? That's sexist. Let me call him out on it. Barrett kept her game face on. He lectured her again, not one question. Why isn't that sexist? She kept her composure. She showed her incredible fortitude because every woman watching today knows what their reaction would have been. It would have mm -hmm. been like, I roll, ask me a question, <laughs> get on with it. They wouldn't have tolerated that, but she did, and it speaks to her character. I don't have that. I would have lost my business. <laughs> but that, I thought that that was notable that he sat there and yeah. lectured her for half an hour. I and really they, every but, woman but in Dagan, the country. Dagan, if he says the Federalist Society has put all these judges, including Amy Coney Barrett, on the court through Donald Trump. But How's that say, wrong? Let me say one thing That's about sexist? that. Will you, the Federal Society has, does not endorse or oppose judicial oh. nominees, oh. number one. They gave number a list two, to the president. Let me finish. I'm speaking. I'm <laughs> speaking. <laughs> okay. Sheldon Whitehouse was... Did, he refused to answer any questions in front of a House Judiciary Subcommittee about his own dark money ties. Oh. He refused. So again, hypocrite and sexist. How do you think the Democrats uh, on the panel have conducted themselves? Feinstein, uh, Leahy, 
my opinion, might have lost their fastball a little bit. Coons, Durbin, I thought, as a Democrat, probably made a more effective case. Absolutely. But you can see the hostility towards her nomination, but not to her. And you could see right. Feinstein, I feel, as though she was answering those who said she lost her fastball. Look, at her age, it's enormous. She goes 3,000 miles every day, to, I mean, uh, every week uh, to San Francisco and back at her age. Unbelievable. So she came out very strong as the ranking member. But the one thing I thought, uh, when Lindsey Graham kind of nailed it in the middle, he said, can I just point out that everyone's been polite? Not one time have you talked over each other. And I think that that's what he wanted. That's what he asked for in the beginning. Not that they're listening to him, but they did. Uh, they actually behaved this way. It's going to be firm. It's going to be edgy. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be emotional, but you can be polite. The world is watching. And for once, I'm watching something and don't feel I have to take a shower. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> what I also know, too, is after going through this, the real hits happen after they testify. Because that's when the Justice uh, Thomas thing came forward with the whole... Uh, uh, with the whole controversy with him. And then, of course, with Kavanaugh, he thought he was in the clear. And then things came out in between that and the committee vote. But having said that, I've never seen somebody more confident. And just keep in mind, if you if you're the uh, ask a former chief of staff of President Trump, he's in control of his own tweets. A lot of times people look around in, in the communications department and say, how do I deal with this? <laughs> That's the same way that, uh, that, this, that uh, Judge Barrett is dealing with this now. It doesn't reflect on her. And I think we all know the President of the United States is, this is how I feel. I want to tell the world. <laughs> he doesn't necessarily do things like every other president. And I think we should stop pre pretending as if we're surprised when it doesn't happen. Yeah, Dana, I, I do want to agree with you. I was really blown away by Amy Coney Barrett today. She's got... You know, bright eyes. She looks you directly in the eye. She's very clear. She's forthcoming, but not. And she's not snobby. She uses a lot of legalese that kind of loses you, and you start losing track of, of what you're thinking about. She was as forthcoming as possible, direct as possible, specific as possible, and showed a sense of humor. Uh, was poised, articulate. You, you really can't say enough about how she conducted herself as a professional. And I thought, maybe this has been said before, but the fact that she had her young kids there sitting silently and quietly for that <laughs> entire time shows you what a good mom she is. In fact, Diane Feinstein asked her at the beginning, she said, and you, your children are so well behaved sitting behind you. And she said, I have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> uh, what I thought was interesting is just thinking about, you know, we've been talking about this presidential election and how many of the candidates, even that ran during the primary, are much older. Yeah. And here you have someone uh, 48 years old, a, a mother of young children, dealing with things that parents all across America are dealing with. She has seven children. One has special needs. Two are adopted. Uh, one wants to be um, a lawyer. Another wants to be a, law uh, an, a writer. The, she, she knows she's trying to manage all of this. She talked about having to, home, uh, not homeschool, but um, do remote learning at home and that they just basically decided, she and her husband, divide and conquer, and that's how they were going to get it done. And I sit there and I think, wow, I can't, I don't even run errands. Like, she is running circles around um, everybody. And, you know, women often ask, can you have it all? And, no, you can't have it all at once, but, wow, she can multitask and is so supported by her husband. That, to me, is a, a really good thing to see.